Today, my talk will be simulating protein folding dynamics in crowded and porous media. So, the first of all, I like to give an idea. For instance, what? It, why am I interested in a crowded medium? Well, the reason is because in the cell, it's a very crowded place. So, assuming for even for a person, if you want to walk around a room, if there's nobody around, of course you can explore all different kind of configurations, extending your legs and arm and so forth. But if you're in a very crowded place or in a very tiny spaces, that your motions are strictly confined. So the same thing will happen to protein folding, but that's the reason why I would like to use some physical method and simulations, trying to show uh, what are the behaviors because of that. And I was told uh, by talking to one of the students, I may probably want to put a little bit of biology here. Is that? Uh, let me give a re quick recap of biology. The information of life is restored in a one-dimensional sequence called DNA. After a process called transcription, translations, pieces of the information can be passed to another kind, shorter kinds of polymers called proteins. In order for this protein to carry functions, it has to fold into a unique three-dimensional structure. We call it the native state of uh, proteins. If it fails to fold in a reasonable time scale, then it will aggregate into fibrils, and that will cause some disease such as mad cow, Alzheimer, and Parkinson's diseases. So it's important to understand the physics of protein folding. These folding blocks will be uh, used as a basic unit for bigger purposes, such as um, this is a DNA polymerase. You have lots of little proteins that constitute a shape that in which they have a channel that can dock or slide on a piece of DNA. When you read through information of uh, DNA, a new daughter strand of newly synthesized DNA will be generated. So, if these informations cannot be controlled carefully, then these rampant interactions, like out of a control interactions, can easily lead to cancer or simply cell death. The talking or communication between these protein complexes are through enzymatic reactions. So, biologists trying to map out who interact with who into a network and how this information flow through each node. Of the network is called the science of signal transduction. How does a cell receive external stress and it responds to it for survival? This called cellular function. Or yes. The okay. The cylinder structure is, for instance, some composed by helices and they form like a cylindrical unit. That we call a second secondary structure. So it actually, is a, a, a lot of uh, little helices, but usually in presentation, they just put into cylindrals. Okay, so yes. That is correct. So, what are the cellular functions? I want just to show some little movies. It is to able handle stress, starvation, and reproduction. I usually joke this is the same concern of a graduate student. So, you have a white blood cell chasing a, a bacteria. So, the biological function of the bacteria is to sense the stress and trying to swim away from the back, uh, white blood cell. The biological function of white blood cell is trying to uh, detect and target and destroy the bacteria. So, these informations are happen. Throughout the cell, okay. So we are interested. What are the、uh, physical principles that drive this machinery? All these information, for instance, that carry the function, go through with all that network I just show you, and these interactions take place in a very small, tiny space, several of a, a nanometer in cubes of a volume, and you have. Those RNA, DNA, protein, lipids, cytoskeletons that takes to 20 to 40 percent of a space. This number doesn't impress you, but let me tell you how crowded is that. For a typical room of this seminar size with 10 adults, then it takes about one percent volume fractions. The time for the mo、uh, that uh, uh, audience uh, to walk. Toward this exit room may take seconds, but if we have a very crowded room, then the time for a person to walk out of the room may be longer because you may establish interactions, exchange informations, and that will actually take longer time scale. 
So the composition of a cell is not like a bag of water. It's very similar to jello. So biopolymers inside is pretty much like fruit in a jello. This is an illustration of a cross section of a bacteria. So the original uh, painting is about a foot by a foot under 1.5 million magnification. Then the size of an atom you can feel like is a grain of salt and ATP, which is the basic currency that drive the chemical interactions, reactions in a cell, is like the size of a rice. And each of these macromolecules are handful. You have DNA here, and you have a little flagella that propels bacteria to swim, and you have membranes. As you can see, the average spacing between each macromolecule is pretty narrow. The previous illustration, and this one, is a, a tomography. It's generated by computer simulations. What you do is that you have a sample of dexedilium, which is amoeba, and then you try to fix it on a little stage and shine, la shine lasers to it at different angles, and you collect the data and you simulate them, and you generate this this beautiful figures. As you can see, there, there ha you have little actin filaments, cytoskeletons, and you have ribosomes that are like little machines to do synthesize proteins and little membranes. So why is it important to study macromolecular crowding effect? Why do we care? It is because we're interested in the following questions. We're interested in drug delivery, we are interested to deliver particular uh, uh, drugs target to a particular place, and we are interested in its performance. As we know that these performances may be affected due to crowding effect. So now the question boiled down is how different it is that with the dynamics of these biopolymers in a test tube or in a cell, like a very diluted case and a very crowded cell. It is an important question indeed, however, not much experiment has been done. The reason is the following. It's because cell is a very compl complicated system. It's too complex for light scattering. Even though it's crowded, but the amount of each kind are little. And of course, it's very much crowded and concentrated is bad for microscopic measurements. So. We are still interested in this problem, but how to get around with this difficulty is by adding so-called crowding agents to the system. Crowding agents that, for instance, uh, some uh, proteins extract from milk that is spherical in size, take up spaces, and or some kind of uh, uh, synthesized uh, polymers that just represents non-specific interactions in the living system, or they would assume because it's so crowded and confined, they can conduct uh, those reactions in the very porous media using confinement as approximation to crowding uh, problems. Since we have this framework, then we can quantify the, the problem, uh, then do, do some quantitative analysis. How does the crowding affect folding kinetics? It turns out it's very complicated because the chemical reaction of protein folding depends on multiple time scales. Some time scales say you can enhance, some time scales get decreased. Or we say, how does the crowding affect, uh, affect the folding stabilities? It turns out that it's, uh, it varies by the kinds of crowding agents. Well, we can ask, how good is approximation of confinement versus uh, crowding particles? And it turns out that the thermodynamic enhancement is still much far from what they get in crowding experiments. So whether the two can be can draw some similarity is still a questionable. How about protein-protein interactions? And it's a very difficult uh, experiment to do because whenever you try to do that, it aggregates and it's hard to do any data analysis. So therefore, there's a role of physicists to come in to do biophysics. It's trying to use some uh, statistical mechanics framework to study this uh, complex system. We would love to do all atom simulations, but however, it's just not possible to include every single degree of freedom to simulate the cell. So our strategy of a pharmaphysicist is trying to coarse grain the system. Coarse grain represents we strip away the unwanted details and just trying to address what are the most dominant factors that affect protein dynamics. In this case, taking up spaces excluding volume effect. So our strategy includes the following. We coerce grain the problem 
and then we're trying to, to establish a relationship between crowding and confinement. In this sense, let me just, uh, before I introduce you with all my little uh, gadgets, let's have a think experiment. If there is a happy protein, you can have extended and you have full states at some temperature a little bit higher than its stability uh, melting temperature. When there's no crowders there, the basically the denatured state or the extended state can sample any configuration they want. All right? But once you have spherical crowders added to a fixed volume, then at certain concentration, or we say volume fraction of crowders, when it increases enough, then will, uh, it will affect the configuration of an extended polymer would it possibly explore. Then that size will be affected, will be a function of crowders. So this is our physical understanding of a problem. In this, based on that, what we do is we coarse grain the interactions. We assume each crowders are spherical colloids. That is about several nanometer in length. In a fixed uh, volume, these uh, crowders are allowed to move around. And of course, that the average spacing between each crowders can be related to the density that is related to the number of crowders in a fixed volume in the system. Then, the volume fraction of all these crowders can be represented by the number densities and the size of the crowders. We're doing some simple replacement, then we can actually relate what is the average distance uh, between each crowders as a function of number density and the size of the crowders. Then we create a mapping relationship. Why, how, why we have to do that is because now it provides a direct comparison between confinement and crowding. As long as we know these parameters, we are able to get the average uh, distance between each crowders and define a sphere. Okay? So which means that in the confinement case, we ignore the fluctuations, but just consider uh, a very a spherical boundary condition. If we have higher the volume fraction, of course, the size of a confinement is getting smaller. Then the question is, and we put a protein inside and run into two different set of simulations and run at the same time. So we can have a direct comparison of the results. So an interesting thing for theori um, the theoreticians is, uh, what, is a, what happens if phi c goes to very large or r s goes to very small? Because most of the models are depends on are, are using so-called Gaussian chain models, the, mo the, 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 the models that can cross over by itself. However, in this sense, as you can see, the excluded volume effect actually forbids the size of the confinement goes to very, very small, which has not been captured by a lot of analytical work. Right? So before I show you uh, all other more stuff, let me just talk, think about the think of the experiment. If today I'm timing a reaction called protein folding, is a time for a protein to sample from an extended structure to a collapsed one. If I started from a more collapsed structure as a result of crowders, in principle my rate of folding should increase. That sounds very nice. But however, as we know, if the volume fraction gets a lot or there's too many uh, particles uh, uh, positioned by itself, then if, because of a steric effect, it will be harder for protein to fold. So before we need even do any simulation, we just by using some physical intuition, we can project that the kinetics of folding as a function of crowders we added. Steric means uh, because by excluding volume, they cannot overlap with each other. This called steric effect. Okay. So now we're going to the next step is we use coarse grain biopolymers. Coarse grain means uh, we integrate out the uh, fast time scales of movement. In the sense, we use something called Longevin Brownian. Um, what we do, so now I have some color coding. The yellow ones are the results from the crowding simulations, the green one from the confinement. So what we do, we run molecular dynamics. What's the difference between Newtonian and Langevin can be addressed here. In a Newtonian equation of motion, we include every single de uh, degree of freedom coming from proteins and water. As you can see, the number of degree of freedom is related to water, and water has to be excessive. As you can see, there's one simulation, the first protein folding, protein folding simulation uh, published in 1998 for a little piece of 30 amino acids, it uses 256 CPUs on a cray. 
as the author said, 255 CPUs are simulating water dynamics. So you can see that if we can integrate out the water dynamics, we are saving a lot of CPU time. It's very computational demanding. That's the reason we use Longevins is that we seize the, the effect as we blindfold the protein and just feel the kick from the water. Even though there's no water in the, in the simulation, but they feel that the random noise trying to kick them. And of course, if you're interested in high friction regime as water, then the Longevin dynamics reduced to a simple ODE and became a Brownian dynamics. And now we only have a degree of freedom that includes the proteins. So I'm to going to talk about how many water no, uh, number, how many numbers of degree of freedom we're trying, we, we get rid of. If it's a small protein, I'm just a, a test protein. It's called WW domain. It's because you have two uh, tryptophanes that uh, reacts to some kind of photo detector, so experimenters can measure its folding rate directly. And if you are including all, every single degree of freedom, you are integrating around 4,000 equation motion for each femtosecond. Okay. But however, if you use coarse grain one, you reduce the number of beads, and you have fewer equation motion, and then your time scale can be longer. Each time scale can be up to three picoseconds, which is a great improvement. Then the thing is about when you use a coarse grain uh, models, then of course the immediate question is how do you make this little protein, a little, little polymer protein like? Then of course that it starts from a, a several theory. I'm going to going to address a little point is that if there is a statistical mechanics of protein folding, it can be described by an energy landscape that can be derived by a few order parameters, such as uh, similarity to the native state, such as the energies to describe the dynamics of the protein. And in order for this protein or peptide to behave a protein-like, rather than the collapse of a homopolymer, that its interaction must follow a principle of minimal frustration, which means that the bump, so kinetic trap on an energy landscape, is much smaller than the energy gap. So you have this quantitative analysis, you can train a, a kind of a Hamiltonian that can behave like a protein-like, okay? And so if we have a free energy as a function of something, order parameters, that's a basic concept of statistical mechanics, is you can describe a complex system using a very few handful of parameters. Then there's a free energy represents the native one, unfolded one, and something in transition. Phi C not equal to zero represents in the presence of crowders. And we postulate what we think before we even do experiments. We think that adding crowders will stabilize the compact form of a denatured state. So it's a double negative argument is destabilize a denatured state. Okay? As a consequence, you relatively stabilize the energetic gap between stabilizing a protein, which assume we have some will we'll predict some very interesting thermodynamic properties out of this model. Let's talk about the uh, the Hamiltonian. Be here we skip the quantum mechanical nature. So we there's no quantum mechanics here. Chemical bonds are modeled by harmonic strings. And then so does the uh, uh, angles, and so does the torsion, and so does the chirality, is the handedness of a molecule. And you have some uh, dispersion interaction, we call it Leonard Jones, and you have some hydrogen bonding behavior that the contact interactions depends on directional property, like angles between two interacting beads. And you have crowding simulations that supposedly the protein does not stick to crowders. They just simply um, provide uh, hardcore interactions. That is, yeah, that, that normalizes into a Leonard Jones uh, uh, potential. That's yeah. So even though we try all our effort to coerce growing the system, it's still not enough to simulate a simple protein as a lifetime of a graduate student or a postdoc, let's say it this way, okay? So which means that we have to do enhanced sampling schemes that can harvest a lot, a lot of computers. I'm talking about hundreds of computers in, in, in nationwide, okay? So this is the simulation details. We have crowding as in yellow, co confinement in green. And we have some Longevin dynamics to explain this equation of motion. And we all, oops, uh, all right. Then we have something called te uh, parallel tempering, which I'll explain later, trying to uh, s speed up our simulation uh, sampling efficiency. So what is the ex replica exchange method? What it do is that if you have 
M replicas, M dif uh, different CPUs. Each CPU will run an independent copy of molecular simulations. And because that at low temperatures, that the structures get easily trapped by local, uh, by local uh, energy landscapes, like little, uh, little, little traps. So that's why if you anneal with the high temperatures, then it will give them a chance to escape from the local traps. And it's very easy to implement. It just uh, include a couple hundreds of lines for coding, and you can greatly um, uh, improve your sampling efficiency. So this is a rough idea of how this method works. In canonical simulations, just write each individual copy at each temperatures. You have lots of confirmations at high temperatures. It's, you're trying to fold and unfold. By lower temperature, you're just stuck at some particular uh, configuration, just wiggle. Okay, so which we are trapped. But if we open a communication between these two simulation box, then we are actually helping them to escape the structure from local, uh, te from from low temperature ones. So this is a better idea how things work. Here I just use like eight CPUs, and each CPU is run independent samples of molecular simulations, and then we establish a tra transition probability depends on the temp the neighboring temperature and then and the energy of that configuration, and then we follow a metropolis criteria to say whether we swap or not. And if the transition probability equals to one, then we'll then you can have like a random number to compare whether they they, they uh, conduct a swapping or not. And the good thing about that is you, it's automated pretty easily, and just uh, run uh, set it in a, a supercomputer center for a couple of days, and then you'll see that it nicely tra travel all, all different temperatures, and sampling efficiency increases by 40 times, which means that something that supposedly simulate in one uh, uh, converge in one month, you can do it probably less than one or two days. So, with all these interesting tools, now we are trying to uh, tell you the results. The first result is to get the thermodynamics. This one is RG. RG is radius gyration that measures the size of a, of a protein. As a function of temperature, phi C represents different volume fraction of crowders. As you can see, at high temperature, the average size of the, the denatured state became smaller, became more compact. It manifests that it destabilized the denatured state because it made denatured state more compact. As a consequence, uh, it stabilized the protein. So I'd like to show you why is it even interesting. Because we have not touched or, or manipulate or tweak interaction of protein itself. We just by adding those spherical particles, then we increase the thermodynamics property or enhance the stability of proteins. And this is purely due to entropical reason. Or if we can uh, measure its uh, folding temperature, it's measured by some kind of uh, uh, fluctuations at a, a, of the order parameters. When it reaches to its maximum, that denotes a folding temperature. As you can see, when Crowder's volume fraction increases, the folding temperature moves towards higher temperature. What does it mean? It, you, you have to increase more uh, uh, temperatures or give it more heat in order to unfold or destabilize a protein. Or if we say, what are the percentages of the configurations that actually can be sampled at the native structures? As we can see, we have not tweaked interaction of protein itself, but just by adding those crowders, we can largely increase the percentage of uh, 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 proteins that can be found in the native state ensemble. So the previous one are thermodynamics, now are kinetics. Kinetics means timing, right? I mean timing, like how fast they fold. So because we have this mapping relationship, we can overlay these two results beautifully. What it do is that when you increase this, the, the volume fraction that uh, maps to decrease the, the size of a pore, yes, at the beginning, the folding rate increases. The error bar is so small, so it can be seen over here. But at some certain point, when you get too crowded or the pore is too, too tight, then it actually hurts the folding rate. So, since we are physicists, we are interested in what is the physical reason behind this phenomenon. And what we do is we check the distribution. Since we have seen our averages, we kind of spread out to see what's the distribution of that uh, size of uh, the uh, proteins under both conditions. And perhaps it can tell us what, why crowding and confinement are so different. So in this sense, what we can see is that this is a radius of gyration, and then we kind of uh, 
uh, plot its prob uh, probability of distribution. Low temperature, where you have a low volume fraction that maps to uh, larger pores, the native state doesn't really change that much. But when you go to a higher temperature, and if you have a larger pore, is the, the distribution still be able to overlay on the top of each other. But when you have a pore size that's very small, or the volume fraction increases, you'll see that one of the distribution from the confinement is uh, deeply skewed. Uh -huh. So which means that the approximation of confinement to molecular crowding is now a little bit shaky. Here I'm talking about is the physics behind this is due to the excluent volume, that the particles simply cannot overlay on top of each other. Think of these as uh, crowders and it's not possible for them to overlay on the top of each other, so such that they have to re repel each other. But however, because it's easier for another kind of protein or different size one to occupy the space, and they can pack better around this protein. So this means that it's a depletion-induced attraction, just because it's entropically better packed as if they are attracted to each other. In this sense, if you're in a crowding case, if it's a protein unfold and fold, you still have some spaces for you to stick out and sample. But however, think about a uh, real spherical boundary. The extended configuration is strictly uh, prohibited. So this is the difference between confinement and crowding. So here's a little uh, picture of protein folding and uh, protein uh, a lot of crowders and you can see there's a depletion layer if we uh, plot the pair correlation function between protein and crowders there's some place in the gray area that represents that uh, is forbidden by the excluded volume effect okay so what it means is that you have a density fluctuation of a medium and protein will reside where the low densities are, are, are. so that's the reason why that you can see as pore size is very small or confinement uh, volume fraction is high, that the physics are different. And it's interesting that we go deeper and try to address this, this uh, feature by using a very interesting uh, order parameter it's called shape parameters. This is derived from inertia tensor. So what it do is that um, delta, if it equals to, to zero, is a basketball. If delta equals to one, is a rod. And shape, S represents shape. If, it, if it's a, a, a basketball, it is a sphere. And if it's a, a oblate, oblate is like a pancake, then S is negative. If it's pro like a football, then it's going to be S larger than zero. So this tells us what are the shapes of proteins in the presence of crowders and confinement. We use that as an order parameter to plot the free energy landscape again. And we can see that as... In bulk case, we can have a delta can go all the way to one, represents protein are able to unfold. And S, you can sample at different shapes. And the arrow represents where the native structures are. It looks like a rectangular box. And you can see that in confinement, the extended configuration are significantly depleted. You can't find any density around that. But at high volume fraction of crowders, you're still able to see some extended configuration. An interesting part is when a pore became too small and artificial uh, structures are populated and that structure is look more like a triangle to better uh, comply with a spherical boundary. So this is the artifact. So the next part of, uh, we'll talk about the transition state is that the crowding and confinement affect the transition state. So what we do is that we uh, fish out all the transition structures in the kinetic simulations and trying to cluster them and see what a dominant structure look like and look at their contact probability. So here I've kind of expanded a matrix of residues because polymer is a one-dimensional sequence, another sequence, and any dot over there represents that they are contact in space. And you have a probability whether they form all the time or blue, did not fall at all. You can see it's pretty much very similar. That, and then we do the same thing for the denatured state, and you can see that the size of the denatured state became more compact in the presence of crowders. That manifests our free energy landscape was the structure being populated, is that the crowding does not affect much on the transition state, but mostly affect on the denatured state. And we also ask questions, well, about you have a sticky pore. 
if, I, if the interaction between a protein and then the, uh, the cavity uh, presented by lambda with respect to its interaction by itself, if you have a, you can have a very rich phase diagram. If you have a very sticky pore, so of course everything glued to the surface. And if you have something that's a little bit sticky but not too sticky, then you can have uh, some native structure and some collapsed multi-globular, I mean just, just gooey part unstructured uh, structures. So this is basically tells us that with using physical tools, we can basically have a broader understanding of what things going on. Even the model is a toy model, but we can have some interesting physics understanding. And of course, the transition state, because of a sticky interaction, that shifts its distribution. Some of them will favor long-range one, and some of them will not. And after I came, uh, uh, joined UH, uh, um, the first problem I give it to my graduate students is that, hey, how about you manipulate the shape of a confinement and tell me what is the best geometry that uh, best facilitate the folding reactions. So it was published and highlighted in Nature Nanotechnology. The students are quite excited. So what we do is that we time all those uh, different folding distributions at different sides of the pore. And then once we figure out that the size that around uh, uh, 2.5 times the native uh, protein structure, then we start to manipulate the geometry of the, the confinement became football, pancake, and so forth. And these ratios will tell us what are the shapes are. And as we can see, that we can even further enhance folding rate if we manipulate the shape. And the one in the football-like really uh, de deters the folding reaction. So we ask why. The reason is because so when we cluster, do the same clustering analysis, we have lots of trajectories in different conditions. And we fish out those transition structures and figure out that the transition structure look like a pancake. No, no wonder when a, the geometry of a confinement look like a pancake, it provides the best mechanistic protein uh, cavity interactions that will facilitate this rate. And we also doing... Uh, my one and a half year at UH, we'll, we'll, we'll try to collaborate with experimentalists at Rice University. So what we do is that we work on the same proteins, and then she do microsco macroscopic experiments, such as uh, timing is thermodynamic quantity, melting temperature, helicity, or CD bath spectrum, and so forth, whereas I can start up the microscopic Hamiltonian and run a simulation. Okay? So these are her experimental data. She found that the protein became more native-like when you add uh, more crowders. And what we found out is that because this protein is very floppy, they have lots of secondary structures. They like to breathe around the, native, the average structures. And we add the crowders, you reduce this breathing motion as if we started trying to squeeze the proteins, become more closer to, to the, to the uh, crystal structure-like. So we, this is actually what we see is that uh, what happened. So this is uh, the difference of contact map is saying what are the places are being squeezed by crowding for the native structures. And these are being squeezed as a uh, denatured structure. We didn't see much of squeezing here, but we see much of squeezing the native structure. Very high concentration uh -huh. of crowders where you actually... Away from the native depends, the depends on the protein. Very good question. Be because apophilidoxin is very spherical. If you squeeze, there's no way to go. We are actually playing with another very interesting protein. This actually looks like a football. But you squeeze it, it will bend it like a spherical one. So you can play a lot of things by, by this kind of squeezing because it's entropic force. It only recognizes the shape but not some molecular detail. So we still use, because of this... Uh, 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 framework, we can further dissect its thermodynamics, the energy landscape, as a function of nativeness in different uh, uh, volume fraction of crowders, which we can do in our simulations. And we indeed see that the native state are being more populated and squeezed more. And of course, we can plot its energy enthalpy as a function of uh, order parameters. Chemists will, will, can take advantage of these numbers and compare them with their experiments. And then we can see how much enthalpy increases or decreases as a result of crowders. And we found that for this particular protein, that its native structure actually being squeezed, so that it actually stabilized a little bit more. So this paper has been published in uh, uh, the proceedings. We're very happy about it. So the conclusion as, as such is that today we did not manipulate the interactions of protein itself. We just add additional stuff 
and we actually make this protein more stable. So this is basically an entropic effect. And how about its kinetics, which is relevant to drug delivery because they want to know how fast or how slow you can manipulate controlling reactions. It actually depends on the volume fraction of crowders. It's a non-monotonic one. So you can speed up at some certain circumstances, and if you have too much, then you throttle them. Think of a question in the cell the boiling fraction go to 40%. In my simulation, I can go up to 25% and I see those beautiful uh, phenomena. See how complicated it is will be in the cell. And of course, if I have sticky interactions, I can play around with all these parameters I want and see a full uh, phase diagram. And we're also in the process to combine theory and experiments and trying to reevaluate the models and all the theories that so it, can help us better manipulate interactions in real cell. So I'd like to thank my former boss and uh, um, Pernilla at Rice University with uh, this experimental group dedicated to this project, some former and current students of mine, and some experimentalists as Rice used. And there are several, our computations are supported by Terragrid, or they call it cyber infrastructure, mostly at Texas Advanced Computing Center, and UH. Texan and Petroleum Research Fund. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah? Uh, what statements did you call them? Uh -huh. How much error did you introduce into the yeah. analysis? Of course. So uh, what we do is we see if whether the density of state converges. Of course, then we can see that um, it related to the number of sample size we have. If the so the error means the standard deviation divided by the square root of number of samples we have. If our, if our system is intrinsically a lot of fluctuations, then we need a lot of n to do that. So we, we do control the error to justify how many swaps or how many simulation days we need to do. Yeah. Uh, TSE, what does that mean? Sorry? Oh, transition state ensemble. Okay, it also means, as far as I can say, prion. That's right. I'm sorry. It's my bad. Yeah. Uh, I uh, got okay. it. The point is now, with prions, which are semi-artificial, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you resolve um, I did simulation on prions before, though. And prions is very interesting. It's because you have to really, um, the reaction has to take place in a very highly crowded conditions to do that, which means that if you just simply add prions together, they will not aggregate. But if you add a little like BSA or those crowders, then you will uh, facilitate reactions for, for aggregation. So even though that the concentration for prions doesn't have to be very high, but as long as it's inside a very crowded uh, species, it can aggr aggregate pretty easily. So this has been seen in simulations and experiments. Yes? Uh -huh. with the yeah. the size and mm -hmm. So I think that's the reason of my motivation to collaborate with experimentalists because what we do is really think experiments. We first, using physicist's approach, just assume that proteins, crowders are spherical and they don't provide any sticky interactions. But in real reality, everything matters. But what we want to do, we want to sort out, like sort the priority. What is the next most important things. So we first sort out is that the exclude volume is important. The next step, the shape is important. As you can see, we have some kind of dumbbell, uh, all sort of different structures that can be manipulated by this stuff. So, so we're in the process of, of uh, gaining more understanding and also polish or revisit our uh, modeling and thermodynamics techniques. And of course, the validity of the Hamiltonian as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason why, like, our projects to go is to how, how does the confinement affect water dynamics? Because over here, we all assume that the, the noise from, from waters are Gaussian, right? But in a confined space, the noise are correlated. So we don't really know how this will affect the, the time scales of folding or even thermodynamics. So the ladies have to go all hand in hand. Yeah. So in correlation with uh, X-ray? Yes. Yes. So this is the data compared with, you say how is it compared because when Q equals to 1 is the crystal structure data. So we use that as our ultimate you know, uh, pole to represent the nativeness. So what we do is that in, in inside, even inside the, the test tube, 
still floppy because of thermodynamics is at room temperature, right? You get frayed and your helices loosen up a little bit. But you add Crowder's, it acts, for instance, increases its, uh, reduces structural fluctuation and make them look like more towards the crystal structure. Uh, <laughs> Yes, this is our our next step. We actually collaborate with um, Argonne National Lab and try to do wide a angle scattering and trying to see how this the shape changes in the presence of different crowders. But these are all excellent questions, and we are like itched to know what's going on next. Native structure. What's the definition of native? Um, it's a very good question because. Most of the proteins, if they can extract or crystallize, that, which means that they already think that structure is a native state. But if that state, whether it's happening inside a cell, may not be identical because the, the reason they can crystallize that is because they add a lot of like metallic ions, pH, and so forth. They force them to be stabilized at that circumstate, right? But however, if you have inside a cell, you don't have those constraints, they may not be able to have a very strict structure at all. It's something to call like a, um, intrinsically uh, like a denatured state. Some proteins are just so floppy is for their functional purposes. They can change their morphology upon binding of interacting partners. So it's, it's a good question. How well, you can define native state? But at this point, we, we just use the crystal structure. It, it could be, and who knows what is native state. And native state could be the state that interact with others, right? Yeah. Or not. Yeah, done. Yeah.